Today I'm going to be talking about a uh, comparative analysis of uh, different performance uh, methodologies used in the industry, including runway analysis. And um, in my 30 years experience in the aviation industry, I certainly can attest to a certain ambivalence regarding performance calculations and performance calculators by operators and pilots. Primarily as uh, aircraft are becoming more and more sophisticated in their uh, avionics, pilots are starting to assume that the uh, FMS and uh, other avionics are taking care of performance related questions. So th as a result of that, there's a certain tomato versus tomato uh, attitude regarding performance calculators in particular, and we're going to show today in this uh, presentation that that couldn't be any more uh, farther from the truth, but there's really more of an apples versus oranges uh, relationship between performance calculators. So we'll be getting into that as we go. Uh, to begin, we did a study of 1,700 pilots, 500 operators. We found a number of very interesting issues that came up. Uh, first, and uh, some of them uh, perhaps won't be uh, terribly surprising to you. For instance, the, uh, the first issue that we found that 98% of the pilots that we interviewed had reported that there was a conflicting method of uh, performance being taught in their training institutions. So this is certainly an indictment against even people like myself. Who, who taught in those facilities. Interestingly though, as when we asked the pilots to um, uh, validate uh, one method over another, that uh, most were not able to, um, to do that. And basically most uh, pilots, again referring to that ambivalence and performance, thought one method which uh, was equally as valid as, as the next. Interestingly, um, again, in the study we found that uh, many, many pilots rely on uh, what we refer to as performance myths in their uh, repertoire of tools for calculating performance. And we're going to get into some of the, uh, the more common myths uh, as they were described to us. These are in no particular order, but uh, you'll notice that they are all in quotes. Uh, these are actual comments uh, made by pilots in our survey. Uh, the first is that uh, the takeoff profile described in the AFM is for certification purposes only, that there are no operational or pre-flight planning requirements based on, uh, upon them. And uh, of course this is obviously false. Uh, the aircraft manufacturer and the FAA have both vehemently uh, denounce this rationale and uh, assert that the AFM uh, is really the only uh, approved one engine in a planning method. The second myth that we came across was probably the most common we've heard. It's the, that second segment is always the most limiting. Therefore, if um, you can meet second segment, uh, you can meet uh, all the remaining climb requirements. Again, this is false, um, uh, primarily because of the way that this is taught in the, in the classes is that single obstacles less than uh, 1,000 feet can use this rule of thumb. However, as soon as any obstacle greater than 1,500 feet or 400 feet, depending on the type of uh, aircraft you're flying, that a, a transition segment and a force segment and route segment need to be uh, analyzed and can, in fact, be more restrictive. For climbs above 1,500 feet, uh, I can simply use the second segment numbers uh, for an airport at a higher elevation. We're going to show this a little bit later uh, as one of the methods that pilots use and the fallacy behind it. but. Uh, uh, again, a very common uh, misunderstanding amongst uh, operators and pilots. The fourth uh, myth that we come across has uh, some validity to it. There's a certain tautology to it, though, that uh, I only fly out of uh, the same airport all the time, never out of a high-density uh, uh, airport, and um, I really don't need to factor in climb gradient requirements because of that. The reality is, is that uh, this greatly restricts your utility of the airplane. You, you may uh, not presently be flying out of a, a high altitude airport, but you may in the future. And most airports uh, do publish obstacle and SID requirements. And the, uh, the odds of a pilot memorizing all the combinations of temperature lapse rates and uh, aircraft configurations and so far is not really likely. The, uh, the next myth is becoming uh, more and more common, uh, particularly as we see uh, providers such as Air Inc. Direct providing runway analysis for free, that uh, if you use runway analysis, this uh, takes care of all the calculations 
uh, and uh, that are factored into runway uh, climate requirement uh, restrictions. Well, the fact is, is that runway analysis doesn't provide climb gradient clearance. It, in fact, it doesn't ensure that you're going to uh, arrive in the enroute structure. It simply provides a 35-foot clearance over uh, known obstacles on a net path. So you could literally be 40 miles away from the airport and still be clearing obstacles on a 35-foot gradient. The FMS calculates climb performance. I alluded to this previously. Again, this is a, a fallacy that most uh, FMSs in airplanes calculate only instantaneous climb performance numbers. The, the moment that the gear door are up and locked, a snapshot is taken, and these are the numbers that you find in the AFM and in the most FMSs. The more sophisticated FMSs, like your columns, for instance, will actually query a climb gradient, but these are also only go up to the top of your second segment limitations. So uh, depending on how many minutes you have on your engine, it could be uh, 1,500 feet, 400 feet, or it could be as high as 4,500 feet. So you have to look at your, uh, the uh, particular aircraft. And again, uh, this is a takeoff of uh, some of the uh, earlier points that the same process used for clearing a gradient can be applied to clearing a, a known or a single obstacle. And again, this is faults uh, at its uh, very basic premise. Uh, actually, all of the rules dealing with a single obstacle are really not valid when you're dealing with a climb gradient, and we're going to get into that in detail here. And the last one is, is that the AFM and the uh, FARs, uh, neither of those require the use of a uh, net takeoff profile calculation or four-segment analysis, and we're going to get into that in some detail. Now, Taking off on that last point, does in fact the AFM require a net takeoff flight path analysis to be performed? And if so, why in fact do so many pilots have this understanding that the only thing that they have to calculate is second segment? Well, there is a phrase in most AFMs that we refer to as in the ambiguous culprit, if you will. And it states something to the fact that if you lose an engine uh, after V1, but prior to V2, but you simply maintain V2 up to a height that would uh, clear your obstacles. Now the problem with this is that the devil is in the details, as in most cases with the FM, that the obstacles that they're referring to here could be a, is, are limited to a 1,500-foot obstacle or a 400-foot obstacle, depending on the manufacturer of the aircraft. And that there is documentation in all AFMs that will clarify this point, that uh, if the obstacle is above... 1,500 feet that a transition segment has to be incorporated into the analysis. Here we show an Embraer, Challenger, Hawker, and we can go on with the list. I won't uh, spend a lot of time each one, but every manufacturer has their own way of uh, uh, clarifying that issue. Now, what does the FAA have to say on this issue? Kobe Johnson, who's the manager of AS410, uh, dealing with operational control issues, has the, this to say in this letter. I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can read it. And um, I think you can see that quite clearly the FAA has a very dim view of using uh, rules of thumb or workarounds uh, or calculating your own flight paths when it comes to dealing with one engine and up uh, climb performance requirements. Also, in the FARs, 135-379, which most people are familiar with, quite clearly uh, talks about a, what they uh, refer to uh, twice within that one regulation as a net takeoff flight path. This is basically the precedence to establish that this, this thing called a net takeoff flight path is, in fact, a legal definition that are found in Part uh, 25 and with, throughout the FARs. Also within um, the uh, POI's handbook and the selective practice within uh, dis discusses that the um, POI has some flexibility here in allowing uh, the uh, TERPS criteria to be used in place of uh, the 35-foot uh, restriction.